Good evening participants. Investing is a complex process. It is more so in trying times like now, as geopolitical issues are in the for forefront of any news. 40-year high inflation in the US and the Federal Reserve slotted to increase interest rates four times this year starting March are the odd topics of discussion in the investor community. As two last two years, every investor looked like a genius in a market trending higher, do-it-yourself investors have st seen steeper drawdowns in their portfolio of late. Steering through trying times is the topic of discussion for today, and I'm delighted to welcome Mr. Dawal Kapadia, Director, Portfolio Specialist with Morningstar Investment Advisors, with 23 years of experience in equity and fixed income. Morningstar is a financial powerhouse with a combined AEM of over 260 billion USD and present in 29 countries. Mr. Dabal will throw some light on investing in a trying times like now. At the end of the presentation and the Q&A, a small survey will pop up in, on your screen, which will not take more than five to 10 seconds to respond. Kindly participate in the survey, which will help us to serve you better in the future. Now I hand over the stage to Mr. Dabal. Mr. Dabal, it is all yours. You can start your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sivraman. I think uh, you know that sets the backdrop for today's uh, discussion. So uh, I've got a you know few slides on a presentation. So I'll just share my screen, and then you know we can get started. So uh, it, you know obviously we, we've seen uh, you know, over the last two years you know uh, it has been sort of a challenging period um, you know for uh, for humanity as a whole. In fact, not just you know the markets time the economy as such, but, you know, we've seen the challenges through the start of the pandemic and so on. And then, uh, you know, just when we thought that, uh, you know, the pandemic, so we must be, you know, the pandemic is in a way behind us. Uh, you know, we are at a stage again where, you know, fresh crisis is sort of, you know, uh, hit us in that sense now, you know, which is the, uh, you know, Russia-Ukraine crisis again. Um, you know, obviously, we all know it's, it's a major humanitarian crisis as well. Uh, a lot of people, particularly in Ukraine, getting you know significantly impacted by this situation, and and of course it has also impacted you know global equity and commodity markets, right? So today, uh, what we'll try to do is we'll try and discuss uh, and and look at how uh, you know this current crisis could impact, could further impact markets, and and what has been happening till date, uh, and importantly, you know what our views are and how should you as an investor you know look at constructing or managing your portfolio, you know, during these kind of periods as such. So just quickly, before we, we uh, start off with the, with the sort of the main topic of the discussion, a little bit about Morningstar. Uh, of course, Mr. Sivram did introduce, uh, you know, the firm as well, but just a little bit more sort of a backdrop uh, on that is that, um, you know, Morningstar was set up in 1984. Uh, this company is headquartered in Chicago. In fact, we're also our shares are also listed on the Nasdaq stock exchange, and you know, which has gained a lot of popularity in recent times. The the index is what I'm referring to, uh, and and initially we start, the company was started with with the objective of providing data and research on mutual funds, you know, for the end investors as such. Now, um, you know, gradually we've expanded into many more areas and many more investment, uh, you know, uh, solutions or or you know, research across multiple asset classes. Uh, currently, the company, pro we provide data on more than 600,000 investment products. And, uh, you know, we're present in about 29 countries, uh, employing sort of more than 9,000 people. Uh, but the, bot uh, you know, but, but the core or, or the, you know, foundation of the company, in a way, the mission of the company is to empower investor success. And this is what it has been since, since the company was sort of started by a founder as such. And uh, when we say empower invest investor success, what it means essentially is to create great financial products or solutions that help investors, you know, reach their financial goals. And, uh, you know, talking a little bit about the investment management group that, you know, me and my colleagues in India are part of. Uh, now, this team or this group globally is responsible for providing 
investment advisory and portfolio management solutions to end investors right and, and typically we partner with uh, with advisors with platforms such as you know pms bazaar to provide these kind of solutions to the end investor as such and uh, you know we are managing and advising about 260 odd billion dollars worth of assets and uh, again you know the group has invested fairly strongly in in the resources right i mean this is obviously a people you know investing is a people driven business right so you need to have the right kind of investment professionals in place so about 550 odd people within this group itself out of which about 95 odd are investment professionals right whose day to day job is to you know track markets build views on asset classes and manage portfolios and so on right and how do we sitting here in india leverage our global strength and our global resources as such so the group is 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 structured into three regions americas india and asia pacific and within each of these regions there is a hub or a center of excellence that identified and you know the countries within that region work closely with that you know investment team uh, in that in that region as such so for instance within asia pacific we have a large investment team at sydney in australia and we work closely with our you know uh, australian investment team to build solutions for the local market and to sort of manage the portfolios and particularly the asset class views on an ongoing basis now you know just moving on to uh, you know what's happening currently and and i'm sure you know a lot of you are observing this uh, otherwise in the markets but just to give a snapshot of of uh, you know how global equity markets have performed or major global equity markets have performed on a year to date basis so this is from you know first jan uh, 2022 till you know until as of yesterday and uh, here we are looking at equity markets across the world and uh, all of these uh, you know returns are in local currency their respective currencies as such and if you start at the bottom of this chart uh, which you normally wouldn't do but in this case uh, probably yes that you know ru obviously russian equities have seen a major fall uh, they are off more than 40% but along with that we've seen you know particularly us markets uh, you know particularly the big tech kind of uh, companies which which comprise you know the nasdaq 100 as well as the s&p 500 growth index uh, these are seen sharper falls as compared to you know many of the other markets of course in india as well we've seen uh, you know mid and small caps fall more than large caps so you know large caps if you look at the nifty 100 index is off about you know 5 odd percent since the start of this year uh, whereas you know small and mid caps are down about you know 9 to 10% uh, and such interestingly you know uh, say uh, you know chinese equities or other emerging markets probably haven't particularly chinese equities haven't you know probably fallen as much uh, the fall is slightly muted because you know we've seen over the last year or so particularly in 2021 we've seen a sharp fall uh, in in chinese equities uh, you know at that point of time and also importantly another thing to notice out here is that we made a distinction between value and growth stocks particularly in the us market where that distinction is more sort of clear and we've seen that you know value over this period has outperformed sort of growth the fall has been lesser as compared to growth stocks so the value stocks will typically include you know the industrials the you know the cyclical kind of sectors and and the growth stocks are you know driven by you know the the it kind of companies uh, you know and, and the defensive on the consumer defensive kind of sector so those have you know fallen a little bit more as compared to the value kind of Uh, sectors and stocks as such, and and on the right hand side you can see how uh, you know the the Russian currency has reacted to this crisis, and you know since about uh, you know early Feb, uh, it has fallen by about you know twenty nine percent versus the US you know dollar as such. Now you know what is it that's driving markets, right? Of course, one of the concerns again uh, uh, you you might have heard of or read about a little bit is, is the fact that you know Russia in a way uh, is an important producer and supplier of several commodities right and here what we've done is we've listed down uh, you know on major commodities and the share that uh, you know russia share of of commodity production uh, you know for each of those commodities as such and and as you can see out here uh, in terms of uh, you know petroleum uh, which includes oil as well as other refined products you know russia made about 16% of the world's you know uh, uh, you know requirements in that sense and uh it is a, in terms of a single producer it is the second largest behind the united states in fact even in terms of natural gas you know russia produces 
uh, about 20, 22% of the world's natural gas. And, and again, it's the second largest producer behind the U.S. And there are several other commodities, uh, not just, uh, you know, uh, uh, oil rated or not just, you know, uh, industrial metals. But even if you look at, you know, uh, agri, agri kind of commodities, wheat, uh, you know, oats and barley and so on. Again, you know, Russia is a major sort of uh, supplier of these commodities to, you know, to the global economy and to global markets as such. So obviously, you know, that's one reason why we've seen, you know, a lot of this um, uh, volatility in markets and particularly in commodity prices, right? And uh, out here, if you look at how commodity prices have moved, in fact, we've just gone back a little bit when we're showing commodity prices since the start of 2020. Um, effectively, of course, you know, at the onset of the pandemic, commodity prices came off and which is what you see on the left-hand side of, of the chart out here. Uh, you know, commodity prices, including crude oil, uh, came off quite substantially at that point of time. And, and just for a brief moment, in fact, crude oil was apparently trading at negative kind of prices. You know, back then it was just for a very, very short uh, point of time. But then effectively, you know, uh, uh, since, uh, you know, there has been uh, obviously signs of vaccine recovery, which happened in late 2000, mid 2020 or so, the expectations of, of vaccines being, uh, uh, you know, being made available to, to uh yeah, you know, to people across the world became a little more apparent. We saw, you know, uh, sort of commodity prices start to move up. And uh, in fact, as, as you can see, anyways, before this particular crisis that we are that we are talking about, the Russia-Ukraine crisis, even before that, commodity prices had moved up quite sharply, right? And uh, uh, of course, the crisis has even further, you know, pushed up these prices. But a bulk of that movement, you know, has happened earlier. And, and obviously, this has been on account of a few factors. One is uh, a stronger than expected, you know, de demand recovery in many markets, right? Particularly developed markets such as the US, Europe. So there, they've seen stronger recovery in terms of demand and consumption. Uh, again, employment growth has also bounced back strongly. Uh, and alongside that, there have been supply constraints, right? I mean, the lack of, uh, uh, you know, shipping containers and so on and so forth. Or, or in the case of semiconductors, again, you hear a lot about it, you know, the supply not keeping up to the demand in that sense. So some of that is, was already pushing up commodity prices, and these have now moved up even you know, further in recent times. Obviously, the biggest move in terms of commodity prices clearly is, is natural gas. Uh, again, as we said earlier, Russia is a big supplier of this, and particularly to Europe as such, and, you know, natural gas prices have moved up by, you know, 375%. I mean, since uh, Jan 2020. Most of the commodities, as we can see, you know, whether it's crude oil is up 57%, uh, you know, in other industrial metals and imports up about 50 odd percent. And even food prices are up quite sharply. And this is more of obviously a recent move also incorporated here, uh, you know, due to, due to the ongoing kind of crisis. So obviously markets are concerned about high commodity prices. And the reason they are concerned is obviously two or three reasons. One is, uh, its impact on inflation, right? And, uh, you know, what we are seeing on the right-hand side of this slide is, is how inflation has moved over the, since about 2021, over the last about one odd year, uh, in advanced economies, you know, the developed markets, as well as, you know, emerging markets on the right-hand side. And as you can see, uh, you know, and, and on the, you know, looking at first the chart for, uh, you know, developed countries as such, you can see that, uh, yeah, here we've plotted how inflation in the US, UK, you know, Euro area and Japan have been moving as such. And the dotted line in between that you see, the horizontal dotted line is, is at 2%, which is normally the inflation target that many developed countries tend to have, right? In India, obviously, we know it's, it's a 4% plus minus 2% is, is RBI's uh, sort of inflation target range. For developed markets, it is typically in the range of 2%. And as we can see in, in all, in most developed countries, you know, of course, in Japan also inflation has moved up. It is still, still at relatively lower levels. But in other, in other countries, we've seen inflation move up quite sharply, right? I mean, U.S. and, and, uh, you know, as Mr. Sivram mentioned in his opening remarks, you know, U.S. is seeing probably the highest inflation rate that they've seen for the last about 30, 40 years or so, right? So, which is quite a substantial thing for a country such as the U.S., right? And what that has done effectively is that it is pushing central banks to try and act to try and curb 
you know, this inflation as such or high inflation rates because obviously high inflation eats into purchasing power and so on and so forth. And over a period of time, it is, you know, inflation stays very high. It's not good for the economy. So therefore, we are seeing central banks, particularly, you know, the Federal Reserve and, and the Bank of England, you know, indicating, uh, uh, you know, uh, monetary policy sort of, you know, tightening measures or rollback of some of the measures that they had taken earlier, right? So, you know, and and this and this current crisis has even fueled inflation a little bit further. Uh, of course, along with this, what is also happening is that uh, there are concerns around the economic impact of, of the current crisis, right? And in fact, uh, there is a sense that the Federal Reserve might probably go a bit slower than what was expected just a few weeks back in terms of their, you know, rate increases during the course of the year so again you know these are important for financial markets because at least in the near term because you know they will impact uh, you know e economic growth and so on so forth if interest rates increase you know economic growth is expected to slow down a bit which is what some of these central banks also want to try and curb inflation but you know uh, and this scenario is getting a little bit more you know complex with with the current crisis that's coming uh, for India, uh, fortunately, inflation hasn't been as much as a concern in recent times. I mean, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and, and as you can see out here, it is still within RBI's uh, sort of target range. In and around that, it has been, it touched about 6% sometime back and it's hovering around that kind of a level at this point of time. Uh, but, it, you know, RBI hasn't been, in fact, RBI surprisingly in its last, uh, monetary policy in early sort of uh, uh, February uh, indicated that you know they expect inflation to come off, come down you know during the next financial year that is you know uh, starting April 2022 so they expect inflation to sort of uh, you know come down as such and uh, if I were to look at India's situation a little more closely uh, on the left hand side you can see uh, you know we've been talking of crude oil and crude oil prices moving up and and you know Russia's role uh, in terms of supplying you know crude oil to the world uh, as such. Uh, if you look at where India gets its uh, you know crude oil from, I mean India imports more than you know about eighty percent of its crude oil requirements, and uh, uh, and the major you know suppliers for this or or where we import this crude oil from is, is obviously the Middle East, uh, in, including the Iraq, including Iraq, and uh, and the U.S. is also a big supplier. Uh, Fortunately, Russia is not such a big supplier, you know, of crude oil to us. Of course, uh, in terms of other sort of oil requirements, such as edible oil, about you know 13 percent of our edible oil, edible oil requirements come from you know Russia and Ukraine as such. So you know, obviously, that is an area of concern. And uh, more importantly, obviously, the concern is the fact that you know a lot of these crude oil, a uh, lot of these commodity prices have moved up quite sharply, right? And uh, uh, and you know, the higher crude oil prices haven't still been, you know, haven't been still translated to to uh, end consumers as such. So end consumers are still not uh, being impacted or, or, you know, the, the petrol and diesel prices across the country in India at least haven't gone up as yet, right? And we know that's on account of the state election. So once that is done, there are indications that probably over the next week or two, uh, you know, from media reports, uh, uh, you know, one would see that, there is an expectation that petrol and diesel prices would be hiked in India very soon, right now. Uh, so that is an area of concern, definitely, that uh, uh, higher commodity, not just crude oil prices, but impacting, you know, other commodity prices also uh, being elevated, uh, you know, how that would impact, you know, margins for corporates uh, and also, you know, the consumption sort of demand as such. If, uh, you know, if, uh, if uh, petrol and diesel prices are mo to move up substantially, uh, you know, it could it would result in higher transportation costs and and feed into other forms of inflation. You know, whatever goods get delivered through transport, and most of them do, right? So those prices might also you know increase. So you know, uh, pressure on inflation from various fronts is is what the concern is, and there is a likelihood that that the RBI might you know if this persists. The RBI might have to sort of relook at their, you know, inflation forecast or inflation expectation for the coming year. So effectively, they had estimated that you know inflation would come down to about four and a half percent over the course of next year. So their estimate was that four and a half percent as an average for the coming financial year. 
Uh, now that seems clearly at risk, given where the you know commodity prices are right now. And eventually, you know, if, if they stay elevated, if RBI is forced to relook at its inflation forecast, they might also be pushed to you know try and look at measures to you know curb inflation. You know, could be you know hiking interest rates or or reducing you know liquidity from the market. Some of it which they've been doing, but you know they haven't really moved away from an accom- accommodative stance as of now. So they still maintain that stance. So you know uh, you know that's an area of concern for. Um, you know, for markets and and for the economy as such, of sure. Uh, you know, just moving on. So we looked at you know what could be the potential impact of of the current crisis. You know how markets have reacted, uh, how commodity prices have moved, and so on and so forth. But you know, if you just take a step back and and you know here what we are looking at is that, and I, I don't want to look at the the graph below. Maybe you could just focus on the the table that's there. You know, above that. Above the lines that you see across the graph, uh, so what this shows is is that you know over the last fifteen twenty years, uh, the various geopolitical events that have taken place, right? I mean, and how have equity markets reacted? You know, three six and three three and six months and one year over you know one year down the line uh, after these you know geopolitical events or or scenarios sort of you know broke out in that sense. Now you know if you look at say. The Iran, you know, drone strike against Saudi Arabia, which I think happened in 2019, or you look at, you know, various other. You have, you know, Russia in 2014 also sort of, uh, you know, uh, annexed Crimea as such. And uh, similarly, if you look at, you know, the Iraq War or you know 9/11 as well. I mean, barring the the 9/11 kind of event, in for all the other geopolitical events, what we see out here is that over a one-year period. Markets have sort of, in a way, recovered, and not just recovered; they actually generated, you know, positive returns, right? Barring the 9/11 event, where the impact stayed a little bit, you know, longer in that sense. So, in other words, what we've seen is that, uh, you know, over sort of uh, a lot of these events have have significant or probably have a larger impact over the shorter term. But you know, as you move ahead, even you know, one year down the line, they tend to be. Little, you know, they tend to get dissipated, or you know, the impact tends to get, you know, reduced over that time period, and and that sort of, in a way, reminds us of of a famous sort of saying from the Second World War, which said, you know, keep calm and carry on. So, you know, that's how we view the the investment scenario right now. We think probably, uh, you know, there is uh, a major impact, but this might be probably more short term in in nature, or the longer term, probably, you know, in, in some, you know, in, in some likelihood. The impact might might uh, you know reduce uh, as such as as we move ahead you know from here. Uh, so that sort of you know it gives me a sort of a segue into how we are looking at investments and what our approach is, right? I mean, uh, how are we evaluating asset classes? You know, not just at this point of time, only or you know across time periods as such, right? And uh, the way we look at you know markets or asset classes is is based on four you know pillars. Uh, you know these key pillars in a way drive our approach to investment, our views on you know and and our outlook on on various asset classes and markets as such. So the first pillar is is we tend to look at the absolute valuation right of an asset class uh, relative to its history right. And I'll, I'll in the subsequent slides I'll also show you some examples or also show you you know based on these pillars how what our views are at this point of time. But for the moment, just looking at each of these kind of pillars as such. uh the first like i said is absolute valuation so you know relative to its history how is that asset class you know looking like at this point of time in terms of valuation right so for instance if i were to look at say indian equities today so today indian equities in terms of valuations you know relative to its history are they looking you know cheap or are they looking expensive so that is the first you know uh, factor that we try to understand or first parameter that we try to understand that today what is the price that i'm paying for the underlying growth expectation or underlying you know value of the security that i am investing in right relative to its own history is it expensive or cheap right the second pillar that we tend to look at is relative valuation right so you know similar assets so indian equity say versus compared to uh, you know us equities or european equities or other emerging markets right or indian large caps vis-a-vis mid and small caps right so how are you know similar assets how are they looking like 
you know, when you compare them to each other in terms of relative valuation, right? So eventually, you know, if you have to invest, it's a relative game as well, right? You have to take a call for one asset class versus the other. Um, even if you take a cash call, it's still, you know, cash versus other asset classes is what you would compare, right? It's a relative kind of a, a measurement that you would do. So that's what we try and do is that on a relative basis, how, you know, which asset class is looking cheap uh, as compared to similar assets within that basket. So within Indian, within equity markets, you know, uh, which asset class is looking cheap uh, as such. Uh, the third thing that we try and look at is contrarian indicators, right? And, and you would have heard, you know, I'm sure many of you are equity investors, you would have heard the contrarian word, term contrarian many times, right? And what essentially what we are trying to do out here is to try and see, you know, which way is the market swinging, right? In the sense that, when I say that, what it means is that is there too much optimism towards a particular asset class? Are too many people buying into a particular, you know, asset class or a particular market, right? Are, are, are people selling off from that market? Normally, what we see is that if there is a big rush for certain, uh, you know, segments of the market or certain, you know, which we saw, say, uh, in, in the US, you know, big technology companies over the last few years, we've seen a lot of people you know, buy into those stocks. And, and normally what we see is there, if there is a lot of optimism towards a certain asset class, uh, which is indicated by certain parameters, uh, it may show us that there, you know, that asset class is probably overvalued, right? It may indicate to us because there are too many people chasing that asset class. On the other hand, if there are too many people selling a particular, you know, asset class, people are exiting it, it may indicate pessimism. And that's where we think you know, value can be found. So that's how we view contrarian indicators. And finally, you know, fundamental risk. So, you know, what is the uh, underlying risk if I make an investment in this asset class? What is the potential for permanent loss of capital if I, you know, make investments? Say today, you know, if we were to look at, uh, you know, obviously Russian equities is an extreme example where today, the, you know, the potential for a permanent loss of capital can be pretty high, right? Given all the sanctions that are being imposed uh, on Russia as such. So, you know, in terms of valuations, it obviously prices have come down quite a lot, but the fundamental risk can be pretty high if I'm looking at, you know, markets such as these. So just quickly looking at, at uh, you know, some of these uh, measures and, uh, uh, and, and, you know, the parameters that I mentioned to you right now, how are we viewing markets, you know, at this point of time based on, say, you know, absolute and relative valuations, right? So what we've listed out here is that uh, our sort of return expectation over the next five to 10 years from various, you know, major asset classes. And very important to note out here that these are real return expectations. So when I say real return is after in inflation. So in the sense that excluding inflation, because to make them comparable across different markets, you know, we take out the inflation factor from there. So we just focus on the real returns as such, right? Now, if you look at, and the other thing that we've done here is that is we've compared uh, you know, as of January end, uh, of course, this doesn't entirely factor in what's happening in February, what's happened in February, but as of January end uh, versus one year ago, so versus Jan 21, you know, how these uh, returns of uh, expected returns have in a way changed over this time period. So if you look at this chart out here, we think, you know, Chinese equities probably are among the more attractive asset classes at this point of time. The expected return from Chinese equities is is fairly high, which is the you know, the, the bluish kind of bar that you see uh, out here uh, is probably higher than most other markets as such. And uh, obviously we saw, you know, uh, and this has improved over the last one year because, you know, we saw a sharp correction in Chinese equities due to, you know, some of the regulatory uh, changes that were brought in, which impacted a number of the companies out there. Uh, but all considered, we think, you know, in terms of uh, return expectations, considering valuations as well, you know, Chinese equities are probably among the more attractive you know, asset classes at this point of time. Uh, similarly, you know, uh, UK equities to us also look, ex uh, you know, attractive, although the level of attractiveness has has uh, reduced a bit, you know, because of, uh, you know, the performance of UK equities in 2021, right? Now, uh, if I move on, if I look at Indian equities as such, uh, again, they're somewhere in the middle of the pack. Uh, they're not, they're not sort of, uh, uh, you know, extremely attractive at this point of time. Uh, you know, we've seen a sharp run up and we've seen, you know, valuations move up as well. And that is why we're seeing, uh, uh, you know, Indian equities not looking very uh, attractive at this point of time. The return expectations are, are slightly lower. 
uh, and uh, on account of the strong rally that we've seen, of course, you know, till uh, till the last uh, few weeks where we've seen some sort of downturn, but broadly since the lows of March 20, we've seen a strong rally sort of uh, Indian in uh, in Indian equities along with other global markets as well. Uh, on the debt side, you know, uh, again, not not nothing very sort of uh, exciting or interesting. I mean, uh, probably emerging market debt is looking better than most other. Uh, you know, debt markets as such uh, is the way we see it. And U.S. equities, uh, just going back to equities a bit, U.S. equities we think are not looking as attractive. Uh, although, you know, uh, we've seen some correction recently, but on a relative basis, they're still looking, you know, relatively unattractive, uh, you know, to us. Now, quickly looking at, at what is it that's driving, uh, you know, these return expectations. So generally, you know, we, we tend to look at, uh, you know, two or three key parameters, right, when we when we are looking at, uh, you know, return expectations from various markets, right, and uh, these parameters include earnings growth and cash flow growth expectations, right, so how is, uh, you know, how are corporates expected to grow their earnings and cash flows over the next five to ten years, then we look at uh, the dividend yields, right, I mean, what is the kind of dividend yield payout that we can expect from, from equity markets over the next five to ten years, and then we look at the valuation impact, right? So are markets overvalued or undervalued and how does that impact the return? Now if I look at India, and this is just a breakdown of the numbers that you saw on the previous slide, uh, the real return expectation from Indian equities, and this would have improved slightly with the fall that we've seen over the last few weeks, but is around 3% or so. Now, this is a real return expectation. If you think inflation and our inflation forecast is at about 5 odd percent, so if you Add those two together, it would be about an 8 to 9 percent kind of return expectations from Indian equities, you know, at this juncture over the next 5 to 10 years now. I, I know that doesn't sound very exciting, right? And the reason for that is, is the valuation factor. If you look at the dark green portions below, these are sort of in negative kind of territory. So in other words, we think, you know, because markets have moved up and valuations have risen uh, and they are, you know, probably above fair value at this point of time. This is reducing the return expectation from Indian equities. So the growth, which is, you know, the light green uh, portion out here is, is, is better than probably most of the major markets. Dividend yields are slightly lower, but the growth area is better. But valuations is what is, in a way, eating away at some of these returns, right? So for most, and this is true for most of the major markets where, you know, the valuation factor is a bit negative. So valuations are, you know, a bit on the higher side or above fair value definitely in many countries, barring maybe a China, where, you know, as we said earlier, we've seen, you know, corrections and valuations are looking slightly more attractive and, and you know, normalized out there. So therefore, the return expectations from China are looking a bit better. I know uh, we're sort of slightly running out of time and I'd like to keep time for questions. So I'll quickly go through some of the remaining slides. And, uh, you know, we spoke of the confidence indicators earlier, right? I mean, what are they showing right now? Are they showing pessimism or optimism, right? And here, uh, within contrarian indicators, we try and look at two or three parameters, which are essentially, um, you know, one is uh, in terms of the momentum score. So how has been the performance of markets, say, over the last six to 12 months? The second that we try and look at, you know, so if essentially markets have done very well, right? Over the last six to 12 months period, it, it acts as a negative, you know, uh, contrarian indicator that, you know, there is probably a lot of optimism in the market if they've done very well over that time period. Similarly, the flows have been very strong, then again, it would be sort of a, a slightly negative factor for us when we are looking at asset classes, right, as a contrarian indicator, right? And then, you know, what are the earnings growth expectations? Like in India right now, the earnings growth expectations over the next couple of years are pretty strong, right? So again, if there is any disappointment and with some of it we might see now with, with the higher commodity prices, you know, so the earnings growth expectations might come down, right? So therefore, you know, at net net, we are seeing that the confidence indicators, although they've improved a bit recently, you know, they are in negative territory indicates that they are, you know, it, it gives us a negative indication that they are not, uh, you know, positive in that sense. Obviously, if they are negative, but, you know, it doesn't give us a very strong signal. So, uh, you know, we would be a little bit wary when we look at the indicators at this point of time. Uh, although, you know, the, there has been some improvement of late as, as markets have seen some correction and such. Uh, you know, now looking at, at a summary of all of this, right, I mean, if I were to put together, uh, you know, the absolute and the relative valuation, the 
you know contrary indicators so to say uh, you know what is the broader sort of what are our convictions or you know across major asset classes you know worldwide as such so uh, the way we show this is, is is as i mentioned you know based on conviction levels for each asset class as such and uh, you know if you look at the left hand side chart out here uh, you know you see that the major equity and you know bond uh, markets are sort of covered here uh, we'll talk of india in the subsequent slide in more detail as such but if you look at uh, and and how the conviction levels work is is obviously if our conviction uh, if we think markets are not looking very attractive or a particular market is not looking very attractive based on the parameters that i mentioned earlier you know absolute and relative valuations and continuity indicators typically they would carry a low or a low to medium kind of a conviction as such now you know us equity falls in that bracket even now uh, because we've seen a very strong performance in us equities you know over the last 7 8 years there has been some correction you know since december but the fall is still not substantial but you know so therefore on a relative basis it's not looking very attractive right whereas some of the markets that are looking attractive to us include you know uk germany uh, china has got a medium kind of a conviction at this point of time and emerging markets as a whole are also holding a sort of a medium conviction you know from our perspective as such on the bond side although interest rates have or yields have gone up a bit because of concerns around inflation and how central banks will react to that uh, but they are still at relatively lower levels right i mean uh, and therefore our conviction on developed market bonds is low whereas we think emerging markets particularly the local currency you know debt for instance in india as well we think you know medium to long term you know debt is looking fairly sort of attractive as such and uh, and just you know talking a little bit more about indian equities and and what our you know view is on that and you know as we spoke a little bit earlier that you know overall emerging markets we have a sort of a medium kind of a conviction uh, in india as well we've seen uh, uh, sort of uh, you know expectations of earnings growth and and profitability improve right i mean uh, particularly over the last 6 to 12 months and you know for a variety of reasons one is uh, measures taken by you know the central government whether it's uh you know the pli scales or we've seen a clean up of uh you know the bad debts in the in the financial system uh corporates deleveraging so some of these factors and we are also seeing some sort of a demand kind of a recovery so these factors combined in a way uh you know is building expectations of an improvement in corporate profitability right now if you look at uh and and the you know the left hand side chart on on the top of here indicates uh you know corporate profits as a percentage of indian gdp right so this peaked in in financial year 2008 right i mean that was when as a percentage of gdp corporate profits were at about you know 5 and a half percent or so and since then they've been on a downtrend obviously we've had some periods when you've seen some improvement uh but more recently you've seen a bigger improvement come through so in other words corporate profitability showing signs of improvement uh you know which is good for equity markets and which is you know is supportive to equity markets and in fact it's expected that over the next 2 to 3 years this proportion will will move towards its longer term sort of average as such uh you know which has sort of uh, not been the case over the last several years and in a way that has been driven by as i mentioned earlier strong earnings recovery and earnings growth expectations and if you look at you know the the chart at the uh, you know bottom left hand side you see you know the the earnings growth expectations over the next couple of years are pretty strong in the range of about 20 to 24 25% cagr is the expectation that you know uh, the rate at which earnings will grow the next couple of years now there is a chance that some of it might be impacted because what we are seeing you know more recently in terms of commodity prices moving up you know there could be a possibility that margins might come down and we think you know the markets in a way have are have priced in more of the optimism right and Uh, if you look at valuations and and if you look at you know the the one year forward p as well as the pb which are on the right hand side uh, you can see you know the, the longer term average for the one year forward uh, you know nifty earnings or, or p ratio is about 18.3 times uh, whereas currently we are at about you know 20 or times as such and although this has come off a bit the the blue bowl line has come down because you know markets have seen some corrections uh, but we are still trading above fair valuations even if you look at the one year forward price to book value uh, again you see that it's above its uh, longer term average um, uh, you know to a certain extent and therefore 
you know, at least the way we are seeing things is that we believe that, you know, markets have priced in more of the optimism. Off late, some of it has come off because of, uh, of, of the crisis that we are seeing out there. Uh, but but they're still not, you know, very attractively or, uh, you know, they're still trading above their fair valuation and stuff. Now, you know, how does all of this convert into, you know, our views and, and you know, what do we think is the right approach, you know, sort of going ahead as such? And, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, we believe that, uh, you know, to deal with scenarios such as these that you're seeing right now, and, and not just these scenarios, but I would say, you know, from, from a long-term investor's perspective, if you're aiming to achieve your financial goals, uh, you know, probably uh, a multi-asset approach is the best approach to follow is to diversify, you know, your portfolio across asset classes, which are not only, you know, uh, Indian asset classes, but also, you know, global, uh, you know, equity markets or global asset classes as well, right? And uh, and what we've done out here is, is just to try and, uh, you know, sort of, you know, depict or, or show, you know, how different asset classes have performed over the last about 10 to 12 years, right? And just to try and show you how, you know, different markets perform in different market cycles uh, as such. So, uh, if you look at what we've done here is that we've put down uh, the calendar year-wise returns for major asset classes worldwide on a, on a, you know, as I said, on a calendar year-wise basis, starting from Jan 2008. And again, it's a busy slide with a lot of numbers, so I don't want you to go through all the numbers. But uh, what we've done out here is to try and simplify it is that for each calendar year, the asset class that has uh, outperformed or that has done the best, performed the best is marked in a dark green shade, whereas the asset class which is sort of underperformed or has been the worst performer is marked in a dark pink or a red kind of a shade, right? So if you look at 2008, for instance, you see that Indian equities, you know, this was the global financial crisis and you saw global equity markets came off, but Indian equities fell more than, you know, most of the markets at that point of time. And, but fixed income did very well during that year, right? So the interesting thing to note out here is that one, it's very difficult to pick winners and losers on a year-on-year -year basis, right? If you look at, again, 2008, Indian equities was the worst performer. But the next two years, it was, again, you know, the top performer as such, right? So you'll have these periods when, you know, you see a variation in performance and you see uh, it's very difficult to pick, you know, which asset class or which market would do well, you know, in the coming or the subsequent year as such. Uh, another thing to quickly observe out here is that when in periods when Indian equities haven't done well, you know, other global markets have done fairly well, right? So if you look at, say, a period like 2013 when Indian equities generated a return of barely 5%, uh, developed markets, you know, led by US were up by about 50%, right? And all of these returns are in rupee terms as such. So it factors in, particularly for global assets, it factors in, you know, the rupee movement as well. So, uh, I mean, not just 2013, but even if you look at, say, 2019 as well, you know, even European markets did fairly well, you know, during 2019 when Indian equities sort of underperformed as such. And if you look at the annualized returns, the, since 1st Jan 2008 till, you know, as of 3rd of March, which is yesterday, uh, you'll see that, you know, uh, developed market equities, in fact, driven by US have done better than most of the markets as such, right, including Indian equities as such. And along with... You know, the returns, we've also, we've also put down the drawdowns, right? What is the downside risk in these asset classes? And again, you'll see that, you know, other markets have, uh, have probably, you know, the downside risk or the drawdowns tend to be slightly lower than in case of Indian equities as such. And along with all of these, we've also included a multi-asset portfolio. Essentially, you know, this is uh, a portfolio which is a combination of about 40% Indian equity, 10%, you know, global equity. Right, that is 50% equity in total and about 45% debt and 5% gold. Right, so like a 50-50 kind of a portfolio, and we've seen how it's performed, you know, over the last about 12 years or so. So you can see out here the performance has been more steadier. In fact, it's done better than many of the individual asset classes, and the risk in terms of drawdown has also been relatively lower as such. So you've got, you know, reasonably stable returns, and you know, which have done better than several individual, you know, markets or asset classes as well as such. So, you know, therefore we think, uh, you know, multi-asset kind of a strategy is sort of probably best place, you know, for investors, you know, planning for long-term goals as such. And, you know, just very quickly, uh, you know, so in terms of the strategies that we offer in India, these are a set of four multi-asset portfolios. 
And uh, as you can see out here, these portfolios uh, invest in a mix of asset classes, which include Indian equity, fixed income, and international equities as such, right? And each of these portfolios is suited for different uh, investment horizons and different, you know, risk appetite as such. So if you have, say, a five to seven year horizon with a moderate kind of a risk appetite, a balanced portfolio would be suitable for you. And as your investment horizon and risk appetite moves up, the other, you know, the allocation to equities and growth assets tends to move up as such, right? And uh, within each of these buckets, the allocations are further split, right? So Indian equity, we invest in large, mid and small. International equity, we are investing across US, Europe and emerging markets and fixed income across, you know, short, medium and long term debt and cash in the portfolio. So the idea is to, is to try and look at opportunities across different asset classes, right? And not just focus on a single asset class. Because as we saw on the previous slide, you know, the winners and losers keep changing. There are other asset classes that will do well uh, or certain asset classes that will do well at certain points of time. So therefore, we think it pays to be, you know, diversified across, uh, you know, various asset classes in a portfolio. Uh, you know, the other thing that we, we try and do out here is that is we try and invest more money in an asset class that is looking attractive at a point of time and lesser money in, in an asset class that is not looking so attractive. So therefore, you see, you know, ranges around uh, for each of the asset classes. Like if I look at the growth portfolio, uh, the domestic equity allocation would be in a range of 40 to 70 percent, debt in a range of 20 to 50, and international equity in a range of 0 to 30. So if I find, and like I was mentioning earlier, that probably Indian equities are looking a little bit expensive, and, you know, particularly say mid and small caps. So I will reduce my allocation to mid and small caps and probably put my money in an asset class that is looking more attractive. For instance, it could be emerging market equity or it could be, you know, debt as well. If I find that is looking more attractive at this point of time from a risk and reward and a valuation kind of perspective. So that is how, you know, these allocations, uh, you know, these portfolios are sort of, you know, structured in that sense. And typically, you know, as I was mentioning, these allocations will move based on our views. So typically, in what scenarios will these allocations change, right? Uh, you know, when equity markets are disappointed, when valuations are looking reasonable, is when we will reduce our allocations to debt and cash and add more allocations to, you know, equities and other growth assets, right? And vice versa, when markets have done very well, we will tend, and valuations are looking stretched, we will tend to reduce our allocations to, you know, growth assets such as equities in the portfolio. So, in a way, you know, it is, in a way, contrarian, but it's, you know, valuation driven as well is the approach that you know we would be taking as such. And you know, just finally uh, looking at how say we are positioned in the portfolios right now and some of it which I was mentioning earlier, you know, this is a snapshot of how the aggressive portfolio is allocated as of date, I mean as of end of February. Uh, uh, large cap allocations, I mean, and so there are two bars that you see across for each asset class, right? So one is we refer to as the neutral allocation and the second is the actual allocation. So what does the neutral allocation mean essentially is that if we think large caps are trading at their fair valuation, in the aggressive portfolio, we will invest about 48% to large caps. Similarly, if mid caps are trading at fair valuations, you know, we'll invest about 13% of the portfolio in mid cap. But currently, like I mentioned, we think small and mid caps in particular are looking a bit expensive, you know, after this strong rally. So the actual allocations, which are the green bars, are lower than the neutral allocation. So mid cap currently is at about 11.5% versus 13% of a normal allocation or neutral allocation. And small cap is about 6.5% versus 7%. Uh, large caps we think are looking fairly valued. So the actual allocation is similar to what our normal or neutral allocation will look like. Similarly, US equities, we are still sort of underweight. Uh, whereas we think emerging market equity, if you look slightly below, you'll see that emerging market, we are you know overweight versus our normal allocation. Similarly, Debt, you know, some segments of debt we think are looking reasonably attractive. So we are sort of overweight some of those segments as well in the portfolio as such. Uh, so just to sort of, you know, summarize, uh, you know, uh, the, the solution that we are offering and, and the benefits that it can provide in a way is that one is a start to end solution. So you can see, you know, right from the decision on how much to invest across asset classes to, you know, the underlying security selection to, constructing and reviewing the portfolio is, is will all be managed by us. Uh, again, you have different options suited for various sort of risk appetites and investment needs as such. Uh, also, you are able to sort of leverage 
our global as well as you know local portfolio management expertise and finally you know lower cost as compared to some of the other uh, you know investment solutions in the marketplace as such so uh, you know that's a nutshell on the proposition and just to sort of you know uh, wrap up with uh, a summary of of what we discussed right for, over the last about 40 odd minutes uh, you know effectively of course we've seen you know this situation has has dramatically shifted investor sentiment you know the russia ukraine crisis there has been a lot of volatility in markets and you know a lot of sort of negative speculation uh, you know that is something that we are obviously all observing uh, energy prices is obviously an area of concern uh, you know for most people but you know as we saw from from particularly the chart where we showed you know how markets have moved or reacted you know 6 to 12 months after you know some of these geopolitical events you know we've seen that it sort of dissipates so some of these concerns tend to reduce you know as time goes by and therefore we would you know still follow the mantra of you know keep calm and carry on so to say and you know we believe that a long term approach you know to investing can obviously help uh, you know against making unwise kind of decisions which are driven by more you know short term fears and concerns so we think therefore as an investor you know it's important to follow a slightly more long term approach uh, you know to investing and try and look at you know the impact of various events on the fundamentals and valuations rather than just you know react based on you know a short term sort of uh, market movements etc so that that to me we are approaching you know this particular scenario at this point of time so i'll stop here uh, and uh, i'll hand over to you mr sivram you know if you can take questions in fact my biggest takeaway is uh, between 2008 to 21 while equities gave wind in the, the indian equities gave 8.5% multi asset portfolios outperformed by 2.1% this is the biggest takeaway for me let us uh, get into the questions now mr jati sharma uh, is asking this question my wife is considering to start a pms and uh, should she wait for a month or two to considering the volatility now or do you suggest this is the right time to invest in a pms fund yeah i mean i would assume that you know you have you and your family have a long term horizon right i mean that's the reason you are looking at investing into uh, you know pms whether it's an equity or a multi asset pms such as r so you know whichever it is i mean you are i'm assuming that it's for a long term goal right so if it's a long term kind of a goal then then i wouldn't really hold back the investment in fact on the contrary you know when you see market volatility it brings up opportunities as well right so i would think that uh, you know uh, you, you don't need to hold back uh, assuming you have a long term horizon like i said you know when markets correct is is the time when opportunities come up right and uh, at best if, if you want you could you know stagger the investment i mean uh, several pms in fact we have a liquid strategy as an option where you know the money can be parked the corpus can be parked into you know a couple of liquid funds and we could do an sgp into you know the main portfolio as such so if at all uh, you know that that could be one option that you could look at but you know given the volatility i wouldn't you know necessarily suggest you to hold back the investment on the contrary i would say the opportunity would tend to be you know greater when we see you know this kind of market volatility as such and uh, manish naram he has asked a string of lot of questions and mm-hmm. one question i found very interesting rbi has forecasted 4 by 4.5% as inflation target is it tenable or uh, uh, do you think uh, 4.5 is less than what is expected to happen in the future yeah i, I think you know the rbi made this projection a few weeks ago you know in early february in that in their recent monetary policy at that time obviously you didn't have this crisis you know and the crisis came our way you know uh, a few weeks after that and more recently as such so uh, you know therefore the rbi probably is also relooking at this situation but net net the markets felt that you know probably rbi's forecast of inflation was probably a slightly lower than what market participants were expecting so uh, obviously rbi had their rational one one of the key rational was that as other central banks start to increase rates and tighten monetary policy right i mean which is what the federal reserve and and uh the you know bank of england have also indicated right i mean uh once they start to do that you know economic growth could slow down and that could bring down economic prices uh, commodity prices as such and that would eventually bring down inflation 
even in India. So, but at this stage, of course, it seems very debatable whether a four and a half can be maintained. It seems a little bit difficult, particularly if commodity prices stay elevated as they are right now. I mean, crude oil prices have obviously moved up sharply and so on. Uh, so, we think that you know RBI will also be watching uh, you know that number also very closely. The corporate profit to GDP is subsimilarly low compared to US. Do you think uh, the, your uh, uh, projection for Indian equity returns is little less than what is expected as uh, the, 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 uh, the kind of uh, the profit growth is expected to be very good with a growth of 7.5%, uh, Indian economy is likely to grow. And uh, what is your input uh, as the corporate profit grows the returns from Indian equity will get better? Yeah, they should. I mean, definitely there is no doubt that India will be among the, uh, you know, the fastest growing economies. I mean, that is the expectation at this point of time. Uh, and, and uh, but, but the challenge, you know, as, as if you are, you know, if you saw in that earlier slide that I am showing is that, you know, markets in a way have priced in some of this near term optimism, at least, uh, you know, there. So therefore, if you look at valuations, they are slightly above you know, normal or fair levels. And therefore, that is pulling down the return estimate at this point of time. So, yes. But, you know, as you go into the longer term, as you go, say, beyond 10, 15 years kind of period, the impact of valuation tends to reduce, right? But we believe that over the next, even over 5 to 10 year periods, valuations play an important role in terms of driving, you know, both returns as well as risk. So, therefore, you know, given that valuations are slightly rich, uh, you know, at this point of time, the return expectation is is a slightly low, but in fact, at this point, and the person also mentioned U.S. equities, but the return expectations are better than in case of U.S. equities at this stage, right? I mean, given that probably U.S. has had a much stronger run-up uh, over the last seven, eight years as such. The long-term uh, uh, returns, and in fact, at the 18.3% uh, uh, the which you told, the premium has come down drastically. And do you think... Uh, but still it has got scope to come down or is it uh, uh, it is likely to go up is what uh, an investor wants to know as the premium has come down from 80-90% to less than 10% now what is your input? Uh, yes I mean with the recent correction in markets but although keep in mind that markets still haven't fallen very significantly as we saw the year to date number Indian equities are off you know maybe about 5-10% to 10%. I mean Obviously, certain stocks, certain sectors would have, you know, uh, fallen more. But, you know, at the market level, that's what the fall has been. So, uh, I mean, if you ask me, it's obviously very difficult to try and time the markets and say, all right, you know, this is the bottom or this is the peak. You know, every time you try and do that, the markets will always, you know, uh, surprise you. So, I wouldn't try to hazard a guess, but I would say that and I would say probably return expectations where we are sitting today, right, given where markets are today are probably slightly lower. And this is what we showed in the previous slides as well, that, you know, the return expectations are lower because, you know, valuations are still slightly uh, richer. Although, you know, the extent of that overvaluation has come off a bit, uh, as we saw in the previous slides, but then it is still above fair value. So I would, in a nutshell, say that, you know, return expectations are still slightly lower. And although they've improved marginally, but they're still relatively low. The government borrowing program is going to get fattened now. With the bond yields are uh, going up, what is your outlook on the debt side of Indian market? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an important part as well, right? A lot of people tend to ignore what's happening on the debt side, but we think debt plays an important part in, in any portfolio. It not just, I mean, it acts as a cushion to the portfolio. At times, you know, it can generate superior returns as compared to equity which we saw in the, you know, in that slide where we had the calendar year-wise returns as well, you know, debt doing well in, in some of those periods. Uh, so, but just coming to the current scenario, yes, there is a concern around, uh, particularly of late, you know, those concerns have increased with, uh, 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 with commodity prices moving up and with, uh, you know, concerns around inflation rising. So, uh, you know, with those, you know, kind of concerns, Increasing, obviously, there, there is, uh, you know, there is a likelihood that, you know, the government might have to relook at its borrowing program and things like that, but it's too early, right? I mean, bond markets yields have gone up a bit over the last few days with, with the higher, you know, commodity prices and so on. 
But you know, again, both the government and the RBI are aware of this situation. I mean, they are seeing all of what we are seeing and probably you know trying to understand it a bit more as well, right? So. uh you know they are aware that they can't allow inflation to move up too much they are aware that if in, if rbi is supposed to increase increase interest rates you know it will impact growth negatively right so given that uh, you know the government can take some supply side can you know some measures in a way to try and address some of these issues right and i'm sure you know at least what one understands from media reports is the government is is prepared to look at different areas for instance just on you know the petrol and diesel prices you know there are some indications that uh, you know the government might uh, look at cutting the taxes on on petrol and diesel right which we know comprise 50 to 60% of the price is is going towards taxes right so uh, because the underlying price might need to go up right i mean uh, but you know they might cushion some of that impact of the underlying price of petrol and crude going up by reducing taxes so in a way you know although the overall price might still grow, go, go up but it might be a little lesser than uh you know uh, you know then then people expect because uh, they might reduce the taxes so in in other words you know they are looking at they will be looking at ways to try and address you know these kind of concerns but just coming back to the bond the debt market in fact we think that the medium to long duration the 5 to 10 year kind of segment on the on the debt side looks fairly attractive so we think the real interest rate spread so if you look at say the one year treasury bill today is at about roughly about 4 and a half percent whereas the 10 year government security is at about 6.8% the the yield on that right so the differential between these two which is about 2.3% kind of differential which we refer to as the term spread right what you're getting for holding a one year paper versus what you're getting for holding a 10 year paper is is much higher than what it has been historically so historically that spread is in the range of about 100 to 150 basis points or 1% to 1.5% and today it's at about 2.3%. So therefore we think that the 5 to 10 year kind of segment looks you know relatively attractive you know uh, from an investment perspective. See uh, some there are uh, some inputs but we have over reacted to these geopolitical issues and uh, uh, in the uh, when indian con- in the indian context what is your input uh, do you think uh, our investors have over reacted uh, by selling uh, uh, the recent correction what is your input uh, i i see i don't think it's without reason right because what's also happened is that uh, you have to look at this the recent correction in the context of what has happened over the last two years right from the lows of of march 2020 markets have have moved up by more than 100% right i mean small and mid caps are up by uh, uh, you know 130 140% and so on so forth so the rally has been pretty strong now even if you look at you know currently if you look at the last 3 year 5 year returns these numbers are also looking fairly decent right all about 15 17% small and mid caps even better so effectively what i'm trying to say is that the performance has been very strong the returns have been very strong and this is on the back of strong earnings expectations from corporates right that the recovery has been decent in india you know corporate profitability has improved uh the government is taking various measures and so on but you know along with that the earnings growth expectations are pretty high over the next couple of years as i mentioned you know earlier as well that uh you know at least for for you know large cap companies the earnings growth expectations are anywhere between 20 to 25% right now with what we are seeing on the global scenario commodity prices even moving up further if they persist at those levels those will impact you know margins for corporates out here right i mean they will they will uh you know uh, their profitability will come down right so therefore there is i wouldn't say it's without reason or i wouldn't say you know the reaction that you've seen out here is is uh, is an over reaction i wouldn't really say that there are definitely concerns but these concerns might be more near term in nature so the, the next question and the the, the, the uh, what is your uh, allocation to china in the current portfolio and uh, there is a sub question to that how often you relook at the allocations uh, to various components in your portfolio correct yeah i think those are very two good questions i mean particularly the second one is so just to address uh, a, you know the the question around 
uh, how often do we relook and i'll also address the question on the china ex exposure as such so uh, typically you know because and as you would have seen you know through some of the slides where we said that uh, the returns that we are drawing or the return forecasts that we are drawing are for longer term periods right 5 to 10 year kind of a horizon right so given that context these return expectations don't change very significantly with small market movements right with a 2 3 4 percent market movement you know these return expectations may not undergo a change in other words the point i'm trying to make is that typically the allocations might see a change if if we see market movements in excess of 10 15% up or down so that's when we may change some of the allocations you know based on how the markets are moved and based on how our you know return expectations and risk expectations in a way have changed right uh we review the portfolios you know every month the allocations but the changes don't happen every month review doesn't mean a change it just means that we are relooking at or or just trying to see you know how uh, whether our risk and return expectations are changed and so on and so forth so typically that activity is done on a month on month basis but the changes are are, are not so you know frequent as such is what i would say and to the second question around uh, allocation to chinese equity so we have some allocation in the so there are two ways in which we have exposure one is through the emerging market fund that we hold so about 30 35% of the emerging market fund is in chinese equity uh, and we hold about 3 to 4% of the emerging market fund and in the aggressive portfolio we have a pure china equity fund of about you know with an allocation of about 2% so if i were to add the two up it is about you know 3 to 4% allocation to chinese equities in the aggressive portfolio as such Mr. Dawil, a lot of other questions have come. Uh, we don't have uh, overshooted the uh, uh, so slotted time by already by ten minutes, and I would uh, like to thank the participants and Mr. Dawil for an excellent presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you would have enjoyed it as much as I have done. Thank you very much.